and gentlemen, based on the results given, I declare John Dramani Mahama president elect. Thank you very much. Dr. Faijan told us there would not and should not be more votes in the box than were ballots given out. So why were there so many stations of obvious overvoting? In total, these votes amount to 1,340,080. All of this is backed by documented evidence. I was just here working. Is it wrong for me to belong to a party? No. Freedom of association. And I choose which party I belong to. What was I doing? Just working for my party. My party has been cheated. And I'm working for my party. Just that I was working. And they were here with armed guns. As if we, we are armed robbers. As if we are criminals. In my Well, the next plan is to turn around to the government and tell to the government, if you are not afraid of what we will produce in court, then leave the matters alone. I accept with all humility. I want to take this opportunity to thank Ghanaians for their confidence reposed in me. Everything in my bones, in my upbringing, and in what I have done with my life thus far, makes it imperative that I accept a decision made by the highest court of the land, however much I dislike or disagree with it. We've received a statement, very brief a statement from the president's chief of staff saying this was an untimely and sudden death, that John Arthur Mills at the age of 68 fell ill and died just a few hours after being admitted at number 37 military hospital in Ghana. We expect him to get more details of exactly the circumstances that led to his death. It's been reported that a few he, he just recently he came back from the United States. Issuing a statement of tribute on Tuesday, Obama called Atta Mills a strong advocate for human rights and a champion of his people. Atta Mills promised to spread is one of the primary challenges facing Ghana's new leader. The country is heading to the polls in December. Atta Mills was to run again, but his party's ticket will now be taken on by Dramani Mahama. Faithful and true to the Republic of Ghana. John Dramani Mahama is Africa's newest leader. He was sworn in just hours after the announcement of the death of his predecessor, Ghanaian President John Atta Mills.
based on the results given. I declare John Dramani Mahama president elect. Thank you very much. The Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice, who oh, come to the Father. The main opposition party in Ghana is disputing election results declared by the country's electoral commission. The governing party's John Mahama was... Enough reports have come into the MPP election headquarters to make us believe that the elections had been marred by lots of irregularities to undermine the credibility of the elections. We cannot uh, allow uh, this sort of thing to go unchallenged because I think it breeds a certain kind of mistrust of the general population for our democratic enterprise. Voting without verification was 456,933. Same serial number for different polling stations, 50,278. Missing signature on the pink sheet, 208,523. And words and figures don't match, 3,841. Now, in total, these votes amount to 1,340,018. All of this is backed by documented evidence. At this stage, the scene was set for a court coalition between the announced losers of the elections to be called the petitioners and the declared winner, as well as the Electoral Commission, to be called the respondents. Article 64 of the National Constitution and the constitutional instrument called CI-74 provided the basis for persons aggrieved by the outcome of presidential election 2012 to contest the results at the National Supreme Court in Accra. This event will constitute the major legal challenge to presidential election in the now 60-year-old history of the Republic. Ghana is widely seen as a modern beacon of the African democracy. She had also been the first to win political independence from colonial rule in 1957. The first real elections in Ghana had been fought as a parliamentary election in 1951. Subsequently, elections were fought in 1954 and 1956. All these were won by the socialist CPP, the party of Ghana's famous first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. In 1960, Ghana became a republic and a plebiscite was organized to appoint a president. The Prime Minister, Dr. Nkrumah, defeated the opposition leader, Dr. Dankwa, to become the first president of the Republic of Ghana. I, Kwame Nkrumah, do solemnly swear that I will well and truly exercise the functions of the high office of President of Ghana. The First Republic was overthrown by a military coup d'etat in 1966. The process held the promulgation of a new constitution and a second republic in 1969, preceded by the parliamentary elections. The first thing to be done is his particulars will be checked for the polling assistant to satisfy himself that he is the person whose name appears on the register. After that, the base of his left thumb will be marked with special indelible ink and a cross will be made upon his palm and he'll be issued with as many ballot papers as there are candidates. Then he goes into a screen compartment, that's where his, this voting is secret, and he will select the ballot paper of the candidate for whom he wishes to vote, put that in an envelope then destroy the rest of the ballot papers in a receptacle provided for that purpose. He comes out, his envelope will be checked, then he goes to vote in the ballot box in the open. There will be only one ballot box at each particular time for the receipt of ballot papers. Those elections were won by Dr. Buzia, and he became 
Ghana's second prime minister. We present to you Dr. Kofi Abrefa Busia, by the grace of God, Prime Minister of the Second Republic of Ghana, and request all manner of persons to recognize and acknowledge him as such. Another coup overthrew that republic, and a new constitution was adopted by Ghanaians to create a third republic, which was preceded by the first ever presidential election in Ghana in 1979. It was won by the left-leaning party, the PNP, an offshoot of Nkrumah's party, the CPP. I, Ella, the man, having been elected to the high office of president of Ghana. This third republic was also overthrown by a coup in 1981. And that led to the creation of the fourth republic through the promulgation of another constitution, elections were conducted, voting occurred, and announced winner was the incumbent military ruler called J.J. Rawlins by a new party called the National Democratic Congress. The outcome was however disputed by the opposition elements, led by a famous history professor, Albert Edubohin. The opposition boycotted the parliamentary elections and called for improvement to the electoral system. Some of these improvements, such as the need to use transparent ballot boxes, occurred in the 1996 elections, which was also won by J.J. Rawlins. This election seemed acceptable to the opposition, and Ghana gained high marks when the losers of the election, led by J.A. Kufo, warmly congratulated the winner on Inauguration Day in the presence of special guest Louise Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, a Nigerian dictator, Mohamed Sani Abacha. And I was just saying, this is a good sign. And you see Mr. Kufuwa shaking hands with Nana Kumedu Hajiman Rawlings. This is a very historic moment. President Rawlings shaking hands with Dr. Edward Mahama. And isn't this a wonderful moment? You can see Mr. J.A. Kufuwa talking to Minister Louis Farrakhan. Professor Mills smiling behind Mr. Kufuo. This is a historic moment. Ghana scored more marks as the opposition won the elections in 2000 after two rounds of voting. It was the first time in Africa that power was changing hands in a peaceful and democratic way. J.A. Kufuo, the new president, was also re-elected for a second term. Election 2008 became the closest ever elections. After two rounds of voting, the contest was so close that voting in a small constituency that had been cancelled would have to occur to determine the winner. We were unable to hold the elections in the time constituency. The results are so close that the result of the time constituency could affect the eventual winner. So we have decided to run the election in time on Friday. Eventually, the opposition won both the presidential election and majority seats in parliament. The magnanimous concession of the loser Nana Adodankwa Kufuado, who lost by just over 20,000 votes, made international headlines. I'm not downhearted by the result, of course disappointed. I'd expected to win. Um, I think most people in the country thought I was going to win. Somehow it didn't turn out that way. Uh, the official results are different. Uh, as a politician, you have to take the high with the low, the rough and the smooth. So by 2012, Ghana had become a fully matured democracy. The challenge to the election results thus became a major test case of the resilience of Ghana's electoral systems, judicial integrity, political maturity, and general sustainability. The year 2012 itself saw the death of Professor John Evans Atta Mills, the incumbent president, on the 24th of July, and the automatic rise to the presidency 
by his vice, John Dramani Mahama, who became the presidential candidate of the NDC for the elections in December. The Ghanaian jurisprudence is designed to follow the British system, with its heavy reliance on the ratio dissidenti in decided cases according to the principle of stare decisis. Thus, as there was no previous ruling of the Supreme Court in an election petition to which the court may have been bound, this case was a novelty in all its dimensions. And the bells of litigation started ringing when at 9 p.m. on 9th December 2012, two days after voting, the Electoral Commissioner, Dr. Afari Jan, declared the incumbent the winner of the poll. Scores of young men led by the vice presidential candidate and others had been working on the pink sheets which were used to record the results at each polling station to see if their suspicion of irregularities in the conduct of the election could be evidenced. Hour after hour, they seemed confident that there may have been major issues with the elections. Alarms were sounded when on one night during their research and preparation for a possible court case, they were visited by armed police. I was just here working. Is it wrong for me to belong to a party? No. Freedom of association. And I choose which party I belong to. What was I doing? Just working for my party. My party has been cheated and I'm working for my party. Just that I was working and they were here with armed guns as if we, we are armed robbers, as if we are criminals in my own country, in Ghana. But literally we saw a squadron of maybe close to 50 um, soldiers and police people uh, who came in yelling at all of us to lie on the floor uh, for some reason or the other. So all of these young people, maybe about 50 of them, uh, had to be lying on the floor, including um, Akufuado's um, nieces um, who were all here. Bring tension down by sending armed men to raid an office where people are peacefully going about their work, just doing their mathematics. Nobody here was manufacturing bombs. Nobody here was assembling any weapons. If they had wanted to come to see if any weapons were here, all they had to do was to come quietly with a, uh, a, a warrant and they would have been shown around. Instead, they come invading the place, throwing people around, ordering them to lie down on the floor at, uh, you know, at danger of death. And, then, and to do what? Well, the next plan is to turn around to the government and tell to the government, if you are not afraid, of what we will produce in court, then leave the matters alone. Soon after this incident, the opposition held a press conference to share some of the evidence with the media and announced that they would be headed for court. Now, across all the 24,000 or so polling stations that we've looked at so far, overvoting was 620,443. Voting without verification was 456,933. Same serial number for different polling stations, 50,278. Missing signature on the pink sheet, 208,523. And words and figures don't match, 3,841. Now, in total, these votes amount to 1,340,018. All of this is backed by documented evidence. The party did try to alert the Electoral Commission and recommend polls to investigate our concerns. The Electoral Commission would not listen and adopted the attitude that had always characterized their reaction to any criticism of their actions. Quote, if you are dissatisfied, go to court. The first petitioner, Nana Adodankwe Kufuado, now in his second presidential election, has also been an attorney general and a foreign minister for Ghana in the earlier NPP government. His antecedent, father Edward Kufuado, and two maternal uncles, 
J.B. Dankwa, and William Ofurieta were all founding members of Ghana's first political party, the United Gold Coast Convention, formed in 1947. His father later became president of the Second Republic. Professionally, Ekufuado had dedicated most of his youthful years to political mobilization, towards democracy and legal battles towards human rights, as occurred on 9th May 1995. As the demonstrators moved from the Kwame Nkrumah circle towards the center of Accra, a group of young people, mainly from the association of CDRs, were also seen moving in the same direction. We have just received a statement signed by the Minister of the Interior, Colonel Osewusu. The statement says, the security agencies took a number of precautionary measures to protect life and property. These included the deployment of personnel along certain routes and sensitive installations, as well as aerial surveillance. Supporters of the Alliance for Change, formed by some opposition politicians, namely Messrs. Nyaho Tamaklu, Akufuado, Reku Brobi, Akoto Ampao, Kwesi Pratt and others, clashed with members of the Association for the Defense of the Revolution who had formed a human shield around the Makola market with some unidentified, which some unidentified persons had attempted to burn down the previous night. Following the scuffles which took place today during the demonstrations, there have been some casualties. So far, five have been confirmed dead. A number of people have also been arrested. The first petitioner also served as Attorney General and is famously remembered for his contribution towards media freedom by boldly removing the criminal libel law from the statute books. It is good that the initiative that we have taken today, they support it. Because, Mr. Speaker, that is what the nation wants. The bill before this House is very much in accordance with the sentiments of the Ghanaian people. And those who still yearn and hanker after a return or a maintenance of the status quo, which allows governments to persecute journalists, are completely out of step with public opinion in our country today. He also led an important matter in Ghana's march towards unity. It was the launching of the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission, along the lines of the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Committee. The testimonies that came out of the hearings and the committee's firm handling of the issues helped to reconcile the nation and the first petitioner was credited for leading the process. Truth commissions provide an avenue for the public to become aware at first hand of the extent and scope of human rights violations in their own country so as to reflect on them and with one voice resolve that never again shall this be allowed to happen. Executions may have taken place, but I did not see it. Like I'm saying, I did not have the time to go beyond the three, four, five minutes of watching what that uh, dissident had to say. Because nothing hurt me more than when for the second time in the history of broadcasting since the revolt of 79, whether it happened in, uh, what's his name, uh, President Liman's time, and then the second time in, the, was it during the PNDC period, when a whole library of films were destroyed. You know, a film that depicted the reality of what ha was happening in those days. Why do we want to destroy and to, and to distort the history of what we went through? Is it because we want to conceal, you know, the nature of things in those days? It's not fair. We thank you for coming. Oh, yes. Sir. Yes. <laughs> please, please, no, no, uh, no. please silence. No, we subpoena no, no. you to produce a tape and uh, a video recording. You say you have neither. So there's no need for us to continue uh, asking questions oh, oh, about oh, oh, it. Oh, oh. If we need you, we'll call you another time. All right, all but right. For today, that is all we came for the tapes oh, oh, oh. and the recording. Thank you. As foreign minister, he announced Ghana's famous hosting of the 50th anniversary of the African Union to Parliament. As honorable members are aware, 
the Assembly of the Union, that is the gathering of heads of state and government, at its meeting at AU headquarters in Addis Ababa on 29th January, unanimously elected the President of the Republic, His Excellency John Ajikum Kufo, to the Chair of the Union for this Jubilee year of 2007. This is the second time that a Ghanaian leader has been so honored. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president, chaired the deliberations of the then continental entity, the Organization of African Unity, at its third summit, which took place here in Accra in 1965. Just as in 1965, the convening of the OU, OAU summit here was a tribute by our peers in Africa to both the pioneering role our nation played and the sacrifices our people made in the struggle of the, for the liberation of our continent from imperialism and the outstanding contribution of our then leader, Kwame Nkrumah, to the growth of Pan-Africanism including the creation of the OAU itself. So today in 2007, the holding of the, OAU, the AU summit here is an acknowledgement by those same peers of both the historic significance of this year's golden jubilee anniversary of Ghanaian independence and freedom and the beacon of good governance being lit along the path of Africa's renaissance by our country under the mature, skillful leadership of John Ajikum Kufo. I met Anado when I was about 17 or 18 years old, and that's quite a while ago. I met him through my cousin, a gentleman who himself was a lawyer. Anado has a very fascinating sight, and somebody who's very fun-loving. And you know this is a gentleman who's very passionate about his politics. And so when you see the fun-loving side of him, it's, 
pretty interesting. What I admired most about Nanado was the fact that he would sit at the feet of his elders and learn from them. And that was one example to me of how good he was at doing that. And he loved good music. I remember one of his favorite artists was Al Green. <laughs> For me, it was an experience in the sense that it was important to have a career as well as to enjoy yourself as well. Because two sides, there are always two sides of a good coin. The third petitioner was party chairman Jake Obechebi Lamte, a media and advertising legend. Jake, as he was popularly known, had been widely credited with the victory of President J. A. Kufo in the Apoko election 2000. Jake was the campaign manager. He had held government portfolios including chief of staff under Mr. Kufo, becoming party chairman. His father, Emmanuel Obechebi Lamte, had been part of the first political party and also part of the famous Big Six. Before the court case started, there was an application to have a live broadcast of the case. The application failed, but the Chief Justice of the day, Mrs. Georgina Wood, per administrative fiat, allowed the live broadcast on national television. We indeed made an application towards that. It was refused. The other side vehemently opposed live coverage. Somehow, one day we went to court and the cameras were there. Apparently the Chief Justice had taken a decision that we should have the cameras. Even then, the panel headed by Justice Atuguba wanted to know whether we were in support of it. Even though a decision had been taken already by the Chief Justice, of course these proceedings were also being covered by the cameras and it fell in line with what we wanted originally, so we supported it. The other side, who had vehemently opposed live coverage, suddenly became converted <laughs> because the cameras were rolling and said they were in support of it too. The way it was done, however, um, left something to be desired. It was a, a kind of administrative decision of the Chief Justice, not related to what the panel of judges itself had determined. Usually if a, if a court is going to make a determination about how its proceeding should be covered or not covered, it would make it itself. But it looks like we were in a situation where the Chief Justice had already decided and the television vans and cameras were already there. And so, I mean, it, it, it was that aspect of it that also didn't seem uh, exactly proper. And, and you know, really, Leaving aside just the purely legal issues about this, I personally worried about the impact on productivity for the country, even though I have to say that at the end of the day, um, it probably eased some of the tensions around the matter. I think we spend a lot more time watching uh, Kun Kun Bajia, <laughs> you know, less important issues. This was a very important matter. It concerns the process by which the people transferred their executive power to a president. I got to cover the Mike Tyson rape trial um, in Indiana um, because the courts allowed uh, a televised version of those rape trials. So I thought it was very good. And the reason 
is because when it comes to issues of high salience with enormous public interest and also the potential for controversy, it, televising it allows for a lot more people to have access to the proceedings. It brings transparency and I think it lessens the burdens on those who made the decisions because people can sort of follow to see the outcomes. The question is whether or not the exercise of the right to have it broadcast had some legal legs. I think it did because if you look at the Constitution Article 1263, you know, except for public matters of public order, public safety or the security of the state, then all proceedings of the court are supposed to be in the open. This was a petition that concerned the exercise of the sovereign will of the people of this country. And therefore, for even for practical purposes, you had to define public to include everybody viewing it because not all of us could be in the courtroom. Then there were two other applications, one of joiner to allow the NDC party to join the case. Then the other on discovery. I recommended that in future, the rules should be tightened such that only the party to the election and the electoral commission should be made respondents and no longer political parties because by my experience during the trial I realized that the gender of the party, that's the NDC, was really not necessary. The NDC as a political party had a lot at stake. I mean John Mahama was not an independent candidate. He was a candidate of the NDC. And in a situation where the NDC's government effectively was going to be undermined by you know, a long process in court and so on, um, it was my advice clearly that uh, the NDC should take uh, center stage in, in, in coming into court, joining the action and in, in defending uh, the results of the election. So that's what led us to apply to be joined, which itself created an interesting situation, as you know. And I think that our opposition to that application was solid. And properly, the NDC should not have been made a party. It was from then that I became apprehensive as to which way this court is going to go because in my view, that joinder was wrong.
my lords i am in court this morning on my own behalf and on behalf of my fellow petitioners to challenge the declaration of the second respondent for the results of the second of the 2012 election to challenge the declaration um, because the evidence that we have indicates that this declaration cannot be supported by the primary document governing this election. For most people who saw the case on television, it was defined by two main contests between lead counsel for the petitioners Philip Addison and electoral commissioner Dr. Aferi Jan and the other between Chachu Chikata and Dr. Baumia. Now, Dr. Farijan, from the list you have, there are 179 pink sheets. From the list you have in your hand. But the list starts from 601 to 779. They're not serially numbered, so I cannot tell. 601 to 779. That is the numbering that I see. Yes, you know, and I'm the, saying that the total yeah. is 179 mm. pink sheets. Yes, my lord, from the list, yes. Now, I'm further suggesting to you that this list of 179 unsigned pink sheets is not included in the 905 that you admit have not been signed. My lords, I would not be able to tell without checking. And Dr. Faridan was quite an irritant witness in that uh, he was very reluctant to speak the truth, even in very obvious cases. Polling station, is that pink sheet in your hand? Uh, this is DA primary at uh, Francy. That is the same polling station that you just identified as being a counterpart, is it not? That's correct. And can you see a different exhibit number from the exhibit number that you gave us? Y yes, this is, that's what I said, MBP 001617. Yes, um, but on this one, this exhibit here, can you see yes, a Yes, MBP 1735, my lord. That is again a matter of duplication, is it not? Yes, it's mislabeling, but the counterparts exist, and in the context of the analysis, these are duplicate serial numbers, and so it doesn't change the analysis at all. You know, Dr. Baumia, we, we have the exhibits that we have, and that is what this cross-examination is about. No, it isn't in both P and J. If you look at the analysis, if you will care to look, we cannot use the nature of the analysis. We cannot use more than one polling station in the analysis. Do it Dr. wouldn't Dr. happen. Balmier, just look at your own information. There was an attempt to create, at the beginning they said 26 categories, they cut it back later to 24 categories. And they, in, in order you know, to make it credible, they try to make the categories exclusive. In other words, if you are dealing with polling stations under one head, you can't double count under another head. Council wants to suggest that somehow we are double counting, but he's afraid to get our analysis to look and see in the analysis that we are not double counting. If he's interested in the truth, he should get me to show the court the analysis. And then came the final day of judgment. The tensions were high, the town was quiet, and shops were closed. People remained at home, and this was a Thursday. Tensions were mounted as judges did not turn up even two hours after the advertised time. Everyone was wondering what was happening. Those in the court, people locked at home, and the president, whose presidency was being challenged, were all watching on television. I could immediately tell that something was amiss, and it did not bode well for us. The delays made me fear that there was some kind of horse trading with the greatest respect because it is not 
typical of the Supreme Court. They had come in, they were just waiting in the room there, and it took hours. Why? I think the length of the, the wait was commensurate with the, the length and gravity of the matter we had to decide. Um, this was, uh, by all standards, the uh, most delicate and uh, all important national uh, matter. Before we finally come to a very clear decision, sometimes even when people, <laughs> judges are going to court, it's possible for a judge to say he has changed his mind on this. It does happen. Uh, in the past, even <laughs> it used to happen. So, a matter like this, uh, we wanted to be very, very, very sure of each judge's clear stand on each of the, 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 the issues. And um, because of that, when we had to uh, recap the issues one by one and be, be a record for finality, the stance of each justice, uh, arguments still ensued one way or the other. So we had to fine tune the whole thing uh, so that um, uh, when the decision is rolled out, uh, everybody uh, exposition is firmly and clearly captured. And when the verdict came, it was winding and totally confusing. Atuguba Adinira Bafu Boni, Badegwe and Akoto Bamfu, JJSC dismiss the claim relating to absence of signature of presiding officer. Atuguba Adinira Doche, Bafu Boni, Badegwe and Akoto Bamfu dismiss the claim relating to voting without biometric verification. Answer. Owusu and Eni Yabua JJSC grant all the three claims, that's to say over voting, absence of presiding officer signature, and voting without biometric verification. And all the votes involved and order a rerun of the affected areas. Doche JJSC grants the claim of... There was uh, some usefulness in what we did because uh, this was a very uh, hot uh, suit. And you recall that um, right from the beginning and throughout the trial of the case, the hearing of it, um, uh, various castigations made on various judges and all that, <laughs> you know. And um, the day of decision, uh, one could call it a very volatile day. And so, uh, if you look back at the terrain of uh, vilifications, attacks, and also speculations on the persons of the judges uh, for taking one stand or the other, uh, it, if you made things uh, so presently uh, naked with regard to the identities of the judges on the various issues, uh, matching it against the uh, uh, tempestuous background to the petition. Uh, one would think that uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, advisable. Be that as it may, the last sentence of the verdict was clear. The petition had failed. In the circumstances, the overall effect is that the first uh, respondent was validly elected and the petition is therefore dismissed. Our various judgments for the sake of convenience are handed over to the Registrar of this court. <laughs> There was jubilation at the seat of government, but given the conduct of the case, everyone wondered what the petitioners would do. The first good news was that Nana Ikufuado, 
called the president to congratulate him. And then came the grand concession. Whilst I disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept that what the court says brings finality to the election dispute. We shall not be asking for a review of the verdict so we can all move on in the interest of our nation. Everything in my bones, in my upbringing, and in what I have done with my life thus far makes it imperative that I accept a decision made by the highest court of the land, however much I dislike or disagree with it. And I think that, um, you know, Nana Kufuado, now president, actually gained more in stature by that concession. And I'm sure that has certainly helped him subsequently in the minds of, you know, the Ghanaian population. Everything returned to normal, and Ghana was now an established and foremost African democracy. Some people disagreed publicly with the verdict and the process of the hearing. When I took the judgment that they themselves had given in the court, I read the judgment and found out that some of the arguments being advanced by the judges and the conclusion they reached were contradictory. Some were saying that, okay, this one should have been so and so and so and so. But then I said, what is the meaning of that? So I say, on the totality, if you look at all the judges, what they were saying, the majority of the judges were in fact in favor of Nanadu. Some people gave the impression that uh, the verdict uh, properly uh, analyzed was to, should have gone in favor of uh, the plaintiff. Quite clearly not. I mean, and this kind of thing, you know, uh, to uh, the ordinary man, would mean that uh, something had, <laughs> you know, uh, drastically gone wrong with, with the decision process and that it wasn't the correct verdict. Very, that is very, very, very unfortunate. The next election was, however, going to be carefully watched. The NPP repeated Nane Kufwado and Dr. Baumia. President Mahama was also in the ballot looking for a second term. There was a certain internal uproar about the decision. So it's as if Ghanaians couldn't connect with the evidence that they had seen and the judgment that had been made. I'm convinced that the Supreme Court took a policy decision. The, you know, people win elections at the poll. And that you could see the coming out in respect of the majority that voted that let's maintain the status quo. So everybody concentrated at the polling station. So in terms of the strategy of the parties, and people went to court and asked whether or not uh, the publication of the results should be done. And the Supreme Court actually held that they could paste those things. The, the counting had to be done over there according to Article 49, and the decision will have to be tabulated, signed off by the agents and representatives, and pasted on the notice board or any object in on, at the polling station. So ultimately, the elections were won at the polling station, so everybody could count. So you notice that some radio stations were able to tabulate all these polling stations. In fact, because of modern ICT, you could even have a shot and send it by WhatsApp or any other state uh, communication medium, and people could then tabulate, put all of that together, and arrive at a conclusion. History was made by Nana Ekufuado and Dr. Baumia. They had become the first opposition candidates under the Fourth Republic to win a straight first round victory and by a landslide to take over the reins of government. Mr. John Dramani Mahama of the NDC had 4,713,277 votes, being 44.40%. Mr. Nana Akufado of the New Patriotic Party had 5,716,026 votes, being 53.85%. On the basis of the foregoing figures, and by the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and the returning officer for the presidential election, it is my duty and my privilege to declare Nana Adudankwa Akufuado as the president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. Yeah. 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 Yay!
Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for a time like this. We thank you that the battle indeed was, has been, and is the Lord. We thank you for keeping and guiding Nana Ekufuando, Dr. Baumia, and all relevant persons throughout every corner of this nation. It was an emotional moment. Guineans came out in their numbers, dressed in traditional kente, to welcome the new government. I, Mahamadu Baumia, do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Nana, I go down for a kufu ado. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> 